Okay, so next on our list is a reaction called oxymercuration, which is another way of doing the same hydration that we saw in the previous example. And that is adding the alcohol to the more substituted two carbons of the former alkene. So here, what we're dealing with is a two-step process. The first involves mercuric acetate and water, although we could use an alcohol here, at which point we would get an ether. If I had an R group on an OH here, I would still have the R group here. We'll talk about that later. And afterwards, a process called demercuration using sodium borohydride. Now that one is a little bit odd, but not terrible we'll get there um basically what we're doing at first is we're using a metal ion mercury as a surrogate for the proton that we saw in the acid catalyzed hydration so some books will show this a couple different ways uh, one way that i've seen it um, is this where we have the acetate groups like so this is what they actually are and this will spontaneously go away um, to give us a mercury cation. Um, I've also seen a version of it where it's more SN2-like, where the alkene attacks the mercury before this acetate group leaves. Either way, we get exactly to the same point. So it begins like this. It begins like this. We have the alkene... We have the mercury in whatever state, and it has the acetate group again. I'm going to abbreviate that for the most part. So we're doing exactly the same type of thing as before, and for the exact same reason as before, we're getting a cation here. Now, here's where it gets interesting and strange, because mercury has lone pairs of electrons. So, there is an actual formation of a three-membered ring. So, this is the mercurium ion that we talked about in the three-membered ring video as a problem. Now, this has a lot of issues with it, and we're going to see some serious ones in our explanation here, trying to use this to explain what's going on. So, first... So we're almost immediately going to run into a problem with a three-membered ring like this because of what happens next. So we're going to bring in water, which is our nucleophile in this case, although we could use other things. And if this were a typical three-membered ring opening with a reasonable nucleophile, we'd be looking at it being SN2-like, which means we'd be going at the least substituted carbon as more accessible. In, that case, in this case, that's the one on the right. But that is absolutely not what happens. What happens is we get this. We get a tack that's almost exclusive to the, the more substituted carbon, the one that's more hindered, the one that's more difficult to approach. So this presents some explanation problems for us. If this were a pure SN2 reaction, that would never happen. Even with the idea that we've widened this angle here out a little bit between those two methyl groups because of that distortion that I mentioned in the three-membered ring video, still, an SN2 reaction there is unlikely because the other side is so much easier to get to. Why take the hard road? That's the way SN2 nucleophiles look at it. Go for the easy spot. So, we really have to think about this as not being the best of explanations. We do end up seeing anti-stereochemistry, so we're not looking at stereochemistry yet, we will in a moment, but we do end up seeing the approach of the incoming water group, which ends up as an alcohol, um, opposite to where the mercury was. So it basically implies something very similar to that three-membered ring opening. So how that happens is questionable. Reality is probably more like this, that we have an equilibrium opening and closing that ring. So that we're looking at something where, at any given moment, that mercury is not attached to that site, which would help us explain how we end up going after it, because we're back to our friendly neighborhood cation. 
And you'll frequently see this drawn like this. Your textbook, I don't think, does this, but uh, several reference books I looked at have this in it. Um, as sort of an intermediate drawing between those two, that if I have something like this, well, then I still have cation character on both of them. That Both of them are carrying approximately half of a cationic charge, if they're somewhere in between the two possible cations, the mercury and the carbon one. And so we'd still see reaction driven by attack on the cation in an SN1-like fashion. So that takes care of part one. Um, part two is a little ugly. How do we get rid of this mercury? Now, oddly enough, that seems to be a very difficult thing to get an answer to. Um, one which I had to look several times to find. I knew I had seen it somewhere, and it's not in any introductory level book of what we're doing now, so I kind of had to dig for it. And I found it in a doctoral level organic synthesis book, the one that I used for a PhD course years ago. And here's how it works. It's not going to matter to you yet, but it will make more sense as we go on later, because something different is happening here. Something that's not normal is happening here. So we have our mercury neutral compound, and we are removing that mercury with sodium borohydride, which NaBH4. As it turns out, this is a radical process, a single electron transfer process, or single electron process, where we end up putting a hydrogen onto the mercury. Now, ordinarily, we wouldn't say that's a great idea, but normally we don't use sodium borohydride for a radical source, but there are some other pieces of data that go with this using something like tributyl 10 hydride, which is definitely a radical hydrogen source, and it does exactly the same thing. So this is probably very reasonable. Um, that then undergoes a dissociation of the carbon group and a mercury 1 hydride. Now, up to this point, we've been looking at mercury 2. Both of these up here are mercury 2. Here and here are both mercury 2. But then we're going to see a radical chain reaction. Um, again, things we will talk about more in detail in the near future giving us this, so that we basically have a radical reacting with another molecule of what was the starting material for the second step, and giving us this, the hydrogen replacing where the mercury was, um, giving us back mercury 2 as an ion source, um, and another molecule of this. So this piece is coming in here again and this piece goes back around so we have a chain reaction going on here producing this now in our case we have an alcohol um, using the simple case that we started with and we had this so as we treat that with sodium borohydride the second formal step of this reaction what we get is basically a replacement of the mercury with the hydrogen. So just for clarity, we'll put that there. Now, radicals are prone to rearrangements as cations are, but they have other unique properties that are a little bit beyond the scope of this chapter and even in some cases this course. But we do have to consider a couple of things here. Um, one, that three-membered ring that we had talked about becomes more of an issue if we start talking about a cyclic case. So to make this visible, um, I'm going to use a cyclopentane with two methyl groups so that we can see where the hydrogen ends up stereochemically. Um, in this case, there won't be regiochemistry because both carbons are identical. What we actually see in cases like this is we see the alcohol ending up opposite to where the hydrogen comes in. So, like this. Now, if we were talking purely about attacking a cation, rather than that three-membered ring, we would expect to have a 50-50 mixture of diastereomers. We actually don't. It's not perfect, depends on the structure, but at least in, in some cases, there's very good evidence for stereo control. 
And the way that we explain that best is using that three-membered ring, despite the fact that it doesn't work perfectly with our explanation of the SN2 reaction versus an SN1-like mechanism going for the better cation site. So here's where we run into a challenge which will come up many times through this course, the next one, and every other course you deal with in organic chemistry. Sometimes the answer is not quite one extreme or the other, like SN1 versus SN2. Sometimes the answer is a blending of the two, somewhere in the middle. In this case, we're seeing stereo control, relative stereo control, implying an SN2 mechanism, but we're seeing regiochemistry that goes towards the better cation, which implies an SN1 mechanism. So we have some sort of hybrid of the two mechanisms going on here that's giving us this mixture of things we don't normally see. Stereo control is normally um, purely an SN2 issue versus regio control, which tends to be about the cation, which is more of an SN1 type mechanism explanation.